So now I'm going to hand you over to Johnny Temple, the man in the checked shirt, a familiar face to all of us at Bocas. He's a Bocas regular, uh, the founder and publisher of Akashic Books. He's here talking to one of his authors this afternoon, Peter Kimani. You may have seen him yesterday on our Press Freedom panel. So yesterday he was speaking from his perspective as a journalist, and today he's speaking from his perspective as a novelist. So he's going to talk about his latest book. He's going to talk about his life and times and career. And the only thing left me to say is, please welcome them with a big round of applause, and we'll get started. Thank you very much, Nicholas. Uh, and thanks as well to Marina and Marielle and all the other organizers of this wonderful, wonderful annual event. Uh, and it's, uh, it's an honor to be here once again. I'm always, it's one of the highlights of my year to come down to Port of Spain and participate in this. Um, and it is also a great honor to be sharing the stage with Peter Kamani here, who uh, is in from Nairobi, Kenya, which is quite a long way to come, uh, to come to Trinidad. Uh, and we, we just published his book, Dan his new novel, Dance of the Jacaranda, was just published in the United States uh, in February. And um, we've been very fortunate to ha have him come to the United States uh, after, after Bocas, he returns to New York for some events at the Penn World Voices Festival. And so we're uh, fortunate to be able to, to get uh, Peter to this side of the planet a few times for the promotion of his book. So today is just going to be a wide-ranging conversation with Peter about his work, about his new novel, but ab about his other work as well. And uh, it's going to be a mix of conversation interspersed with some short readings. And uh, if we have time at the end, we'll take some questions from the audience. To start us off, I want to just read Peter's bio. Peter Kamani is a leading African writer of his generation, born in 1971 in Kenya. He started his career as a journalist and has published several works of fiction and poetry. He was one of only three international poets commissioned by National Public Radio in the United States to compose and present a poem to mark Barack Obama's inauguration in January 2009. You didn't get an invitation related to Trump, did you? No. <laughs> um, Kamani, Kamani earned his doctorate in creative writing and literature from the University of Houston's creative writing program in 2014 and is a faculty member at Aga Khan University's Graduate School of Media and Communications in Nairobi. Dance of the Jacaranda is his third novel. Okay, so to start us off, before we talk about your novel, uh, I'd like to hear a little bit. Can you talk a little bit about your journalism work and the main beats that you covered in your time as a journalist? Uh, thanks very much. Um, it's a real joy for me to be in this part of the world. Uh, I've been sharing my experience with a few friends how, how familiar it feels to be in Trinidad. Um, the lady who picked me from the airport, Josie, uh, you know, was explaining to me uh, what it is like, but I told her it feels like home um, in, in, a very, in a very intimate and personal way. Um, not to mention, it's also a reconnection um, to my own foundation as a writer. You know, when I started off, I was writing on entertainment, and uh, I was the reggae reporter for the Daily right. Nation. <laughs> so, but not the Soka reporter. <laughs> well, it's very close by, <laughs> so uh, so the island is not so far from uh, from here. Um, and I think the other the other thing I need to mention is that uh, the Caribbean is also very important in my own uh, evolution as a writer because. Uh, Walter Rodney's book, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, has been a guiding light in my own intellectual, um, you know, uh, formation. So, and, 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 and of course, um, I have a few friends from this part of the world. So, my journalism started when I was pretty young. <clears throat> uh, I was about 22. And uh, this was for the largest publication in that part of the world called the Daily Nation. So uh, the Daily Nation distributes across Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, uh, and they have other interest in uh, Rwanda, Burundi. So they're quite established in East and Central Africa. Um, but then I also worked for the Standard, 
which is the second uh, largest, but the oldest. Uh, it's about 115 years old. So it was formed around 1902. Uh, so I worked there as a reporter. I worked as an editor. And uh, at the last uh, you know, uh, position, I was the head of news. So I was uh, covering the entire news reporting for the country and the region. Uh, I had uh, editors scattered across the country and uh, reporters. Uh, so we were on a daily basis getting our, our hand on the, the pulse of the nation, so to speak, getting to know what's going on, what Kenyans cared for, or East Africans for that matter. Did you enjoy your work as a journalist more uh, than as an editor, or were they, did you en enjoy the work equally of those two responsibilities? I think I enjoyed more being a writer and going to the field and talking to real people. Um, I don't know how many journalists are in our midst, but I felt very frustrated to find a story uh, told in, in very limiting terms. And uh, as, as a writer, I can imagine the opportunities that maybe the reporter may have had to expand the scope of the story. So um, uh, I, I kept saying, uh, editing other people's stories all, almost gave me ulcers, stomach ulcers, <laughs> just worrying about the deadline and how the story is, is going. Uh, so I enjoyed, uh, to your question, I enjoyed more uh, writing than editing. And can you give us an, one example of a story that you worked on that was particularly exciting or interesting to you? Yeah, so um, I started as a, an entertainment writer or the arts, arts correspondent because I was writing on uh, theater, uh, film, and, um, and uh, all manner of uh, you know, productions, uh, reviewing books for the, for the nation. So, but then I, I also got to develop other interests. So I, I ultimately worked on, uh, uh, in my final stages of uh, my journalism, I worked as um, the regional, regional correspondent for the Daily Nation. So it meant covering events in other countries. So I went to Somalia to cover the conflict. There was, um, there's still, there's still go, uh, an ongoing conflict in Somalia. I worked in um, the Sudan reconstruction efforts of South Sudan, so um, covering um, HIV and AIDS in Botswana, jazz in Cape Town. So I was, um, I was uh, fortunate to go to all those locations. One of the most, um, uh, there are a number of stories that were, were, were important to me. Uh, and one, incidentally, uh, took place very early on. Uh, just about my second year in the business. Uh, when I, I traced, I helped trace um, uh, relatives of um, some young Kenyan man who had been um, out of touch with his family. Uh, uh, his family was in South Africa and he's in Kenya. He was a Matatu Taut, so you know, uh, public transport system, uh, some guy on the fringe of society. And I helped uh, reconnect him with his sister who was surviving. So that was um, a very, a very, to me, a very, uh, a very fulfilling experience helping ease somebody's pain. So uh, it may not have led to any any major policy change in the country, but helping, uh, you know, one human being reconnect with another. I think that was a very, to me, a very important assignment. Right. And and at what point did you start uh, dabbling in fiction? All right, so my, uh, my writing, uh, my fiction has actually uh, lived side by side with my, with my journalism, with my nonfiction. Uh, I should say maybe journalism pays, helps pay the bill, <laughs> the bills to date, but what I really care for and what I want to break free and do is to write fiction. So it's been a constant struggle that uh, one uh, one endeavor is being supported by another. Uh, so right now it is the teaching of journalism uh, that, that, that helps me pay the bills. But when I have some time, I want to get the next manuscript for you to consider. So, <laughs> so, so maybe if you paid me well enough, I would abandon journalism. <laughs> I'll, t I'll make a note of that. <laughs> and then I'll be a full-time creative writer. Um, 
during the introduction, one thing that I did not say is that the way that uh, Peter and I met was through Malaika Darrow, who is here in the audience and is one of the presenters. And um, she was the agent for, for the deal. And um, for that, I am deeply indebted to Mal Malaika. Although I was already indebted to her for all the great work that she's done in literature over the past three decades. She's been a very, very important figure in uh, the American publishing business. And uh, it's great. I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased that she was able to, to, to be here as well. <clears throat> and it was funny because we, we you know, we, she brought the book to Akashic. We read it. We loved it. We immediately made an offer. And then um, we've done so much work together on, with Peter on his book, but it was uh, not until last night at the big black box that the three of us were actually in the same place at the same time. So that was kind of a, a, a special uh, occurrence um, and very happy that, 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 that we would actually spend time, the three of us together, here in Port of Spain. Um, I wish I could say that for every book that we uh, published. So turning now to um, Dance of the Jacaranda, w w can you tell us a little bit about what inspired the book, where the initial concept for the book sprung from? Yeah, and before I do that, I want also to appreciate Malaika. Um, actually, uh, it was accidental meeting. Uh, even our interaction with, was in, uh, accidental. Uh, a friend of mine gave, gave her book for me to read. And I saw Malaika had helped her locate a publisher. So I thought, well, her name means, in Swahili it means angel. So I thought, this angel who connects other, other writers might as well work for me. So let me... Let me, let me write her. And, and, and that's how we, we met and uh, you know, got to, to talk some more. So my, and of course, when we met uh, Johnny the fa for the first time about two months ago, I am the one who invited him to his house because he had hosted me, but he was away. He and his family were away. So I was the one inviting him back into his house. <laughs> so, yeah, the first time I met him was when he opened the door of my house to let me in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's been a, a very, a very, uh, a very fulfilling, and um, I feel fortunate, really, to have a publisher like Johnny and Malaika is my agent. Um, of course, not all writers say the same of their publishers and agents. So <laughs> I'm just telling you, it's special relationship. It doesn't always work that way. So my my interest in this uh, book, Dance of the Jacaranda, has been um, a journey that uh, has evolved of a long period of time. It's actually been 10 years since the initial idea and the book being, uh, being read uh, happened. So, so I went to uh, the University of Iowa in the fall of 2007. Uh, actually, Kai Miller, the Jamaican writer, and I met there for the first time. Uh, so we were supposed to produce a story and read it before the fellowship ended. And uh, so some people were asking me, so why a hotel? Why, why, why a musician? So, and I told them, actually, I was in a place called the Iowa Hotel, uh, which is uh, within the University of Iowa. And that's where we stayed for three months. So the initial spark of the idea, uh, standing on the staircase of that establishment, was we have power disruptions in Kenya quite often. So I thought... What if the power, what if the lights uh, went out and uh, strangers bump into each other in the dark? So that was the initial spark of the story. And uh, so I did a segment uh, for, the, uh, for the university reading uh, before, before the end of November 2007. So I returned to Kenya um, with a draft of a storyline action happening in this dark establishment in a, in a place that I, I didn't quite locate at that stage. Uh, but then I, I wasn't able to write anymore because we had uh, disputed elections in uh, December of 2007. So politicians who were fighting and uh, disputing the, the polls outcomes unleashed their militias and uh, you know, the country almost you know, fell apart. So that again directed or misdirected my initial storyline because although the initial focus was 
um, an entertainer who is in an establishment where he's well known and uh, lights go out. Uh, I was struck by you know, our, our circumstances. We have 46 uh, communities in Kenya and still counting. People are asserting their right to be counted among the cultural mosaic that forms Kenya. Uh, we have uh, individual histories uh, and, and, and cultures. Um, and the elections were about who we are as a nation. So that, that somewhat uh, led my story to some further exploration. So who are we truly? So we have um, a history that incorporates uh, whites, uh, you have Indians, you have Africans, you have Arabs in my country. And I thought that uh, our, 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 our consistent desire to identify as this monolithic you know, entity doesn't make a lot of sense. So my exploration of that story, uh, starting from the Iowa Hotel, uh, having a political crisis that uh, jeopardizes the future of the country, uh, was the, the evolution that led to now larger exploration of our history and culture, and uh, potentially, you know, uh, hinting at, at our future. So, uh, what I found out as I as I went on with the writing process was that um, I was also, in a way, uh, trying to recover or recuperate. Uh, some, some of our narratives that have been lost through years of colonialism, or uh, well, the British uh, were in Kenya for 70 years, uh, but here I am speaking in their language. So the legacy of colonialism is a very, uh, you know, enduring thing. Uh, but uh, I found when I went to another another talk a few days ago in uh, in the U.S., I was explaining uh, my motivations from uh, a literary perspective, and I was explaining that. Um, I was hoping to recover, uh, you know, Kenyan history because what you have learned uh, from, uh, you know, history books by colonial writers, uh, mainly from their perspective, we don't always appreciate what else is left or left out. And uh, so I was writing about a community that's outside my own experience, um, partly because I was... I wanted to celebrate not just our differences, but our commonalities as humans. So the incident in the hotel when the lights go, go off in the book is set in 1963, is that right? And, but a lot of the action in the book happens 60 years before that. Can you talk a little bit about that? Right. Yeah, so my book explores uh, two time frames, uh, 1963 when Kenya became independent and 1900 at the founding of the colony by the Brits. Uh, so I wanted to know what it meant to be Kenyan in 1900 and then again what it meant to be Kenyan in 1963 because uh, the colony was organized around the idea of racial hierarchy with the uh, whites at the top, Indians in the middle, Arabs and Africans at the very bottom. So in 63, uh, with the onset uh, of independence, I wanted to, to reassess what it meant to be Kenyan because that racial uh, hierarchy was about to be recalibrated. So Africans were taking charge. What would it mean to be Indian or to be, to be, to be white and British in that, uh, in that context? So those two, those two periods were um, uh, explorations of uh, nationhood, and citizenship, uh, but you know, coming out in this year, in 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 this context, you know, in the U.S., uh, I think it's actually a reassessment of what it means to be human. Uh, in America, uh, you know, politicians are trying to define who is more American than others. You go to France, you go to to the to the U.K. Brexit is about citizenship and uh, nationhood. So um, at times, writers will write in the dark, and then they reveal something that's even bigger than their own vision. And I think, with all humility, my, the coincidences have been quite striking. And my own country, in, um, in three months, will be inaugurating a new train, a new rail, so built after nearly 120 years. Um, again, when I started out, I had no idea there would be uh, events that would be speaking to my own experience, although it is imagined, 
it appears to bear quite a lot of uh, resonance with the present. As a side note, uh, you just hearing you speak reminded me that the other day when Funsho was interviewing the Prime Minister and he asked the Prime Minister, what do you consider your orientation? And his answer was nationalist, which was just an, an interesting answer. Obviously, that interview was not so much about politics as it was about his personal past. But that was something I would have been curious to hear more about. Um, so why don't we, um, well, well one, one more question before I, I'd like to have you do a, uh, your first of two short readings. Um, how much research did you have to do into the building of the railroad? Yeah, quite a lot. Um, at some point I realized I might never get the book done if I keep researching anymore. <laughs> because research can kill you. You can waste, no, you don't waste. You can spend your whole life researching. And I thought uh, at some point I have to st stop the research and I get to imagine my story because uh, I did a bit of um, archival research. There were personal interviews. Uh, I traveled to places uh, just to just to re reorient myself with my subject. Uh, but what I did not do deliberately was to take the train from Mombasa to Nairobi uh, because I wanted my reimagining of the story to be guided by, by my own imagination rather than the physical attributes I will see. So the memory that I have of the, uh, the, the train or the rail uh, was when I was about 14, when I went on a school tour from Nairobi to Mombasa and, and back. And uh, so I restricted my, my memory to that uh, initial journey to Mombasa. Yes. Um, one thing, I, I guess I had a sec one more question before you do your reading. I was going to ask it later, but I think I want to ask it now, which was, the review coverage of your novel has been outstanding. The New York Times selected it as an editor's choice, and it was you know, just about the best review you could possibly ask for. The one review that I've seen uh, that was a little bit critical was written by a Kenyan. Um, you and I were discussing this uh, the other day. And um, in the review, the, the, the reviewer suggested that your book was uh, perhaps pining for the colonial days, a sort of wish that, that um, Kenya could reverse its history and um, become a colonial entity once again, which I have no idea how you could read that in your novel. He, however, is a Kenyan, so he, he has more insight perhaps in some ways than I do, though I know, I, I, I understand that's obviously not your intention. But what, what do you think would have led him to take that from your book? Um, do you have any critics in the house? <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's somebody, there is somebody who said critics are those who've, who failed in arts and literature, but I know Lisa is not one of them. Um, yeah, my, my response to, to that review, because I read it and I said, I was just shaking my head cons uh, constantly. I said, I now admit stupidity is a legitimate literary response. There can't be any other, there can't be any other, any other rational explanation, but then you can also appreciate there are stupid people out in the world. So, and this, this specific one <laughs> uh, manifested it with such eloquence, I, I took notice of his stupidity. <laughs> I thought, I, thought per, I thought perhaps it was related to the fact that um, your British characters are three-dimensional characters. And what I will say is that they are, you could look at the main British character in the book and say, this man is a fool, but he's not two-dimensional. And it, do you think that the three-dimensionality of your uh, colonial characters uh, w w fed into this stupidity, as, as you call it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, think, I, think, um, I think you do. Uh, you're right in your assessment. You know, what I, what I did in, um, in my talk, in talking to African Studies program, 
uh, the University of Wisconsin Madison was to explain uh, the literary tropes that I deployed to the story, and and I can share that a little, uh, just to give uh, a response to Johnny's question. So, um, uh, there is a famous book called Manichaean Aesthetics: The Politics of Literature in Colonial Africa, uh, by Abdul Jan Mohammed, in which, uh, you know, taking cue from another yet another writer, actually from this part of the world, uh, Franz Fanon. Uh, from Martinique, uh, uh, France, to, uh, France make a similar assessment that uh, the world of literature in relation to Africa is divided along almost racial lines, black, white, um, uh, darkness, and light. You have, you have those divisions very, very clearly defined. Um, <clears throat> uh, savage versus, you know, um, uh, civilized, so I utilized all those tropes in my story uh, to locate my story away from those divisions. And I thought, you have a black experience written by blacks. You have a white experience written by whites. What about what's in the middle? What, what about the gray areas? People, for instance, uh, an Indian. So who is a metaphor of the in-between world that's being inhabited by by the larger divide that defines uh, African literature. So I situated my story uh, partly in response to that, uh, that I'm breaking away from what everyone in each side is saying about the other, to inhabit an experience that's outside my own. And, um, and um, so people who, who probably read uh, works from other African writers or colonial white writers uh, they cannot understand my work because it's straddling an, un, uh, you know, an unoccupied territory, if you like. Uh, so I am, uh, I am breaking fresh ground in that sense. A Kenyan of African origin uh, using Indians as the primary uh, material for his story. So the other thing I explained to the audience uh, in, uh, in Madison was um, my... My, my larger vision, or what you call the controlling motif, the controlling metaphor that uh, drives the story, is also Joseph Conrad's A Heart of Darkness. Uh, because you'll see uh, glimpses of light and darkness are flashing uh, through, through the book. So when you s start out, you have, um, you have uh, the light in the disco, you know, you, you know uh, going off. So... You have moments, major, major moments uh, in the book are set to tease out that binaries, uh, those binaries, black and white, uh, darkness uh, and light. And um, because colonialism, Western colonialism was supposed to, to be the light that shines upon this dark continent, uh, you know, the characters involved. We have a preacher man who is, uh, you know, throughout uh, the story presents one, one uh, perspective and when the story is finally revealed, you find there are astonishing things that uh, you know are done in the name of religion. So by the end of the story, one is um, left to decide for themselves uh, whether colonialism was a dark chapter of Africa's history or if it was the light that it was supposed to shine. So critics who are not familiar with, um, uh, I wouldn't call it sophistication, but I think there is quite a bit of uh, thought that has gone into the creation of the story. And they're looking for a simplistic story that uh, defines a white man as a white man and, and his actions are guided by that. I think uh, one, of, uh, one of the best, um, best uh, tributes I've read in um, uh, those criticisms is that all characters are treated with fairness and uh, their humanity is not taken away from them on account of race. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's one of the great triumphs of the book, I think. All right. So can we hear you uh, read a, a section of the book? Sure, sure. Uh, so I'd like to give you uh, some quick context that will help you understand this uh, this short, short uh, passage. Um, it is an inside, inside view of the railway workers. You know, you get you know work rhythms. They are busy. They are busy engaged. Uh, uh, busy engaged in uh, in in work. And um, 
uh, you you get to hear names of uh, some of some of the railway builders. Uh, you might need to know that Macdonald is the the British uh, supervisor, actually the British administrator who is uh, overseeing the entire project, and Patterson is another Brit Briton, but he's is the one doing the immediate supervision. And Ahmad is uh, one of the Indian technicians. So I want to give you a sneak uh, preview of the anxieties that they have, as well as um, the absorption of the work at hand. Since the workers were paid by the yard, they toiled hard to cover the assigned distance, sparing little time to catch their breath or break wind. Babu knew, Babu is another, another character, uh, Indian also. Babu knew every little detail of the truck, like the back of his hairy hand. He knew where the spot, he knew the spot where a dry branch broke off a mokidori tree, and workmen fell over each other in flight, and he laughed at their folly. He could point to the spot where a man stood on a rock in Athi River and collapsed as his legs disappeared in a river of blood, his anguished cry only coming in bubbles as the crocodile's nostrils flared for breath. Babu knew the sudden dip where Abdullah, the donkey rider, broke his leg. He could point to the site where his assistant Ahmad found a dry log riven with ants which came to life when he held the python on his back. It missed Ahmad's head by inches, but when he flung it off, it crushed the tripod that had been set up as Patterson opened fire. Four bullets that all missed the target but grazed the tripod, leaving scratches that Ahmad felt every day as he set up his equipment reminding him of his great escape, but also of the danger that lacked. Babu could point to the tree that Mushoki the workman had climbed to escape a buffalo after he'd come upon it with his teeth. Babu had watched the animal wet its tail and swish, swish it this way and that to spray urine on Mushoki, hoping the irritation would make him fall off the low branch. Still, that did not stop the men from earning an honest day's wage. There were yards to be covered, and there was Patterson with his crooked gait verifying the distances crossed. Not even the strike of a hammer on a thumb would deter a worker from pounding again. And when an ankle gave way from a fall down an escarpment, its owner kept walking, perhaps a little less springy, may be a lot more cautious, but determined still. Their jungle green tents had grown threadbare. What once provided a cool shade was now like a shredded palm leaf, offering more relief from the rustle of the wind than shielding against the sun. The workmen's black boots were worn out, and most walked barefoot. The cracks in their heels deep enough to hide a rupee coin. But the rhythms of men crushing stone went on uninterrupted, as did the swish of the seeth nipping vegetation with every swing. Within no time, 100 feet would open where thorns and thistles had existed since God had created the world. Another man would follow closely with makarai full of crushed stone, which was spread spread out over the space where the rail would lie. Carpenters followed with their saws and wood, pencils slotted behind their ears. They would mark where to cut, and the saw would harm its ceaseless song, the pitch different for every man. A saw in the hands of an impatient man squeaked and wailed. More often than not, the saw would break, and a replacement would be delivered almost always accompanied by a slap from Patterson because words didn't come as fast. 
plus a surcharge on the carpenter's account. Patient and skillful artisans, however, had very different outcomes. They would commune with the timber, started with smelling to assess its maturity, then knocking the piece along the grains to check for defects. Then they would wet their fingers and point where the pencil had drawn so that the shavings will not screech with dryness but soak in the moisture. The pitch of the saw would remain even until the cutting was midway, when the tool would acquire a deeper tone, the sound muted by the distance covered and the remaining distance still to be completed. The home stretch brought yet another sound uh, that carried the relief of separation of the waste from the useful timber and the capital's celebration of the successful, successful completion of the task. There were distinctive sounds that came at certain hours of the day, the muted wails of knives and machetes on file, the clang of pots that announced it was lunchtime when black, white and brown workers will cross the train tracks to their respective kitchens. Just like the, just like the rails that remain separate, in spite of their common interest, the workers of different colors kept to their different kitchens for lunch and dinner. Thank you. Thank you. Do you see your work fitting in um, a Kenyan or more broadly East African literary tradition? And if so, how and where? Okay, so uh, my, my own sense you know, from, from uh, the reception so far, is that uh, my book, in a way, does push boundaries. It is not uh, the story that you expect uh, from, from different perspectives. Uh, so uh, somebody remarked during my tour of the US that it's interesting that uh, we are all writing about the same period, you know, the founding of the, of the nation, Ngoge, uh, one of, uh, one of uh, Kenya's best known writers, uh, appears to be harking to the same period. Yvonne Awar, who is about my contemporary, uh, uh, she too has a book called Dust, which uh, looks at uh, uh, colonialism and, uh, and its place in contemporary society. So um, I think what my book does is to, to push the boundaries, to, to defy to defy my simple definition as a Kenyan writer, uh, I, am, I am hoping, you know, by being published in New York to address an audience that's far removed from my experience. Uh, so the reason they are connecting is that uh, there are ways in which my stories speak to their experience. Um, so, so I think uh, what, uh, what, what I can say, some of the the literary uh, influences that, that shaped my work. Ngoge is, very, Ngoge is very important to my own development and uh, the echoes of him in, in my story. But so, so is Chinua Achebe. Uh, but I also have other you know, influences. James Baldwin uh, you know, in the States. In this part of the world, George Lamming definitely well, is one of uh, my, 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 my mentors in the sense that my work does echo questions of identity in, in ways that he did in the 50s. So I am writing in a different context. Uh, and uh, and uh, I can just say uh, Kenyan readers are, are finding uh, a story that can connect, uh, connect with their situation, but in a different sense. Actually, a BBC journalist asked me, uh, would, would you save your country if politicians read your book? <laughs> And I thought that's a very that's a grand vision, uh, but then the Kenya that I am I am I, I am I am speaking of, because beyond uh, you know writing about the Indian experience uh, in East Africa, that also hark to a larger a larger importance that's hardly appreciated, that East Africa is truly the cradle of humankind. You know, archaeological evidence point to Lake Turkana Basin as the origins of uh, you know mankind. So if here we are uh, fighting it out over who is uh, who is more Kenyan than than the other, 
what are the rest of the world supposed to do? So in other words, I am importing an, uh, a lesson that Kenyans should find in resonance, and hopefully, if they read, if they read, they read the book, maybe politicians will be less uh, paranoid about who they are and appreciate their humanity. Who is a must-read living Kenyan or East African author who most of us in this room might not be familiar with? Yeah, I think Ngugi will be very important to, to, to this context. Uh, and uh, one, of, one of the things that you know, people in Trinidad might not know, uh, Ngugi is, um, uh, has been among uh, the few writers who are consistently on the Nobel Prize radar every, every year virtually. Uh, you know, his name is invoked as a potential, as a potential winner. And uh, maybe I've earned uh, my bragging rights that Ngogi was on my doctoral committee. He was among my supervisors. Uh, I think he, he, does, uh, he does make important connections with the Caribbean especially. Uh, so when, when he was the head of uh, English uh, department in, in the 60s in Kenya, um, he refused to carry on with the colonial syllabus. And he led what, what's now called um, uh, this, well, he was one of the early theorists of post-colonial uh, discourse in which he said uh, or he argued African, Caribbean and the diasporas where Africans live those stories should be the foundation of any literature program in Kenya. So the department led to uh, a, larger, a larger conversation surrounding decolonizing the syllabus uh, so uh, what, what was going to be an exercise uh, in, uh, study of, in the study of uh, the, the British canon uh, was scrapped and replaced by writers from the Caribbean. So George Lamming was among the, the authors who became accessible to East Africans. Um, writers uh, from uh, Black America, like Toni Morrison and others, were accessed uh, during that period. And, and then from the, the Kenyan perspective, he also excavated oral literature as a core component of African studies. So Ngugi has two, two collections uh, that are of relevance to Trinidad especially. One is called Homecoming, uh, which, was, which was his reconnection with uh, the, the Caribbean. Um, so he has a collection of essays and then he has Decolonizing the Mind, uh, which is um, a respected title in the theory of colonized societies needing to break free with their colonial past. So Ngugi will be very, will be very important to people in the Caribbean to understand that bridge or that linkage that was asserted about 50 years now and uh, more and more needs to be appreciated about that, that campaign. Ngugi, of course, was um, forced into exile was was his was this academic work at all related to his exile? Uh, actually, no. It was a play. It was a play that he, uh, he wrote in his first language, which is Kikuyu, also my first language. And um, you see, one of one of the things that uh, colonial education does is to you use English. Uh, so your mother, who is not uh, educated, cannot even understand what you're writing. So Ngugi's frustration was his mother, who was illiterate, could not access any of his works. But here was a work uh, that was in, in his own language. Uh, so she could understand that. So he was, he was um, uh, detained without trial for a year, uh, slightly over a year, in 1978 to 1979. The, the crime being the play? The crime being the play, uh, because, because politicians who are paranoid especially, you know the one in America right now is para paranoid about everything, uh, is that uh, when politicians are paranoid, they will be seeking to crush imagined enemies. So one of um, the stories that was published in uh, the Daily Nation, one of the largest papers there, about a week ago, was that uh, there was such enormous pressure from politicians to kick Ngugi out of England, uh, I think I may have shared that story with you, um, which, which just tells you uh, when you're writing things that people are not comfortable with, then you're speaking a truth that they once oppressed. 
Uh, so, so there is a huge campaign about uh, you know, writing in African languages. Um, and uh, we've been in conversation with Ngogi about that. And I keep telling him the work also has to have a commercial value. As a publisher, if you, if, if you publish in writing or in a language that's not accessed by a majority, then you have a very limited uh, readership. So I, I, I keep saying we need to promote those languages, but also develop infrastructure that will support those languages. So if it's uh, policies at schools that will incorporate those works in the curricula, then writers will have work to do. But if you're writing uh, for the sake of it, art for art's sake is the easiest way to starvation, I think. We are um, running out of time a little bit. Um, I'd like to hear uh, another reading and then if, if there's time, take some questions from the audience. Um, leading, in, leading into the next re reading though, um, tell us about the ja jacaranda in the title of the book is the hotel that you've mentioned. Can you just say a few words about the jacaranda, including how you see this hotel in 1963 relating to the earlier section of the novel? Right, so jacaranda, um, we should credit Malaika for, for getting the title. Uh, we had different titles that kept evolving. Uh, do you remember the earliest one? The earliest Kiss title? in the Dark? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so it uh, started, actually that was the second title. Uh, um, the original title was No Man's Land. So this in-between world that my book you know, strived to achieve and then we thought it's too heavy, sounds too uh, historical, almost um, yeah, uh, limiting, limiting from the way people will read it. So, Jacaranda is, is a very important space because uh, I, wanted, I wanted a space where all, all races can inhabit without restriction. Remember in, uh, in, um, in uh, 1960s, up to 1963, Kenya was, as a colony, was, uh, was set to accommodate different races in different places. Um, and I think that's why the train actually, to expand your question, uh, the train is an important metaphor even of uh, the segregation of the time because they built the rail and they have first class, second class and third class, which becomes almost like an experiment, uh, a lab of sorts. Uh, to see how we can replicate these divisions in society. So you have settlements for blacks and whites and for, and, and for Indians. So uh, in that sense, uh, it becomes an important space because excuse me, you're able to ac uh, accommodate different people and the musician uh, who is central to this is a unifying force, just like art, while they can be used as uh, you know, symbols of divisions, are powerful examples of unifying people. So Jacaranda um, uh, is important because in the beginning it is uh, a farmland. So remember, remember the, the, uh, the original vision of this uh, division between black, white. So one of, one of um, uh, the theories that colonial writers uh, make of Africans and Kenyans uh, specifically, uh, so if you talk of uh, Karen Blixen out of Africa, uh, she says, for her to understand uh, Africans, she needed to understand the animals. So implying that Africans used instinct, not intellect. Um, if, you, if you read about uh, another American writer called Robert Truak, something of, of value, writing about the Mau Mau armed uh, you know, rebellion against the British, uh, he, he, he talks about um, uh, uh, violence as, uh, as a natural impulsive response from Africans. Uh, so um, so by, by situating uh, Jacaranda where it is, uh, it's originally a farmland where McDonald's, uh, the, 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 the administrator, is trying to develop dairy, a dairy industry or a daily enterprise. Uh, so the idea being that he's there to civilize animals, the way he's domesticating animals. So there's some parallels here between uh, you know, using animals, which is a very oral tradition in Kenya, in Africa. 
So I tease out uh, those perspectives and uh, so the space that Jakaranda has evolved over time. So from a, a symbol of division to a symbol of unity in, in that sense. Great. Now can we, we'd love to hear a second reading. So my second uh, reading will come from inside uh, the establishment called Jakaranda, uh, partly because there is a lot of music and dance in the story, so I might as well appreciate some, some, some dance from in there. And uh, Rajan is uh, the main character uh, from the story. The instruments were building in temple. Rajan trembled with delight as, as he nodded appreciatively to the instrumentalists, tapping his right foot, responding to a rhythm that appeared to bubble deep inside him. In his formative years as a singer, Rajan would shake with fright before the curtains opened, unsure how the audience might respond. Sometimes, Lines that he had rehearsed for weeks would evaporate at the sight of hundreds of eyes. Now he was a lot more composed, but the dread of performing a show never really left him. It helped when he was under the influence of something. Steam is what they called pre-concert intoxication. He had had a few beers to unlock his mind. Rajan let the instruments play on, the squeak from the keyboard, the wail of the guitar, and the throbs of the drums building into a frenzy. He yanked the microphone from its sand and walked to the edge of the platform as dozens of hands rushed to touch him. He crooned in a low, mournful voice. Baruana kutumia ni kufunze ya dunia usije uka angamia ewe wangwe ewe na we uwe wangwe Thank you. We are just about out of time, but I think we have time for one, possibly two questions, if anybody in the audience should have one. Funcho in the back. writing the play, thanks. It was the fact that one, he wrote the play in Kikuyu. Two, he got the villagers to perform. Three, uh, they created a theater out of that, and that the performance of, of that play was influencing other communities in Kenya to start to challenge authority, and that that was what frightened the Kenyan government. I don't know, but you are closer to it than I am. So if you could just expand on that for us, please. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, um, thanks, for, uh, thanks for that. Yeah, what I can uh, explain beyond the language question, you know, Ngoge's play uh, was denied uh, performance uh, area. The National Theatre couldn't, couldn't accommodate his play uh, because until, I think even to date, <laughs> we have those colonial laws still in place, that you have to secure a permit to be able to perform a play in public. So he was denied, uh, he was denied a permit to stage his performance, and then the National Theatre claimed they didn't have any room because they had uh, blocked all the dates. So Ngoge decided to go to the village where he's from, uh, the place called Lemuru, 
about 40, 30, 40 kilometers from Nairobi. And uh, he mobilized the community. They raised funds to build a makeshift theater, uh, which could accommodate about 2,000 people. So people, uh, you know, joining hands, uh, raising resources, uh, and then performing in the play. So he, he was a university professor, but he got ordinary villagers who could now be able to read this language because it is in, in their language. So uh, breaking these barriers that uh, colonial education does, you know, by insisting upon language, uh, English is uh, the language. So Nguge's uh, experiment became a huge uh, success. Um, and when people are articulating their own issues, well, Ngoge uh, said uh, recently, but he just wasn't writing a play in Gekweo. He was writing a play that challenged the status quo. He was pointing uh, the villagers to where their, their problems lay. So um, he, his experiment, by the way, has been replicated in different you know, uh, contexts across the, across the world. In, in Asia, they have, uh, they have community theater. Actually, the idea of community theater appear to have sprouted from this experiment. And that's why the resistance and the repression from the state was so heavy. Great. All right, so unfortunately that's the end. We've run out of time. Peter's book, Dance of the Jacaranda, is available from multiple booksellers. Um, and let's conclude with a warm and loud TT round of applause for Peter Tamani.